Thank you, Judge Morse. You're welcome. This is the time and date set for CV 210238, Nicholas Waterford versus Laura Sanchez and TLC Custom Farming Company. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded as well as live stream, so we ask counsel to please identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your presentation. Judge Howe has been exposed to the coronavirus. He would be here. He is going to be watching via our YouTube um, the oral arguments this morning for the health and safety of us all. Uh, each side will be given 20 minutes. Appellant's counsel is responsible for reserving a portion of that time should you choose for rebuttal. Also, we've read the briefs. So we've conferenced this case. We're familiar with the facts of this case. Please bear that in mind during your presentation. And at this point, counsel, are you ready to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Please do so. Uh, middle podium? Um, actually, if you'll stay at that podium, we're going to keep you guys as far apart. This Omicron thing is like wildfire. Sure, I just, uh, I, I suspected that was the case. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. May it please the court? Please proceed. Good morning, my name is Kevin Barrett. I represent the appellants, which is uh, Laura Sanchez and TLC Custom Farm, uh, Farming Company. I'll just refer to them as Sanchez. Um, I'm gonna reserve 10 minutes of my time for rebuttal. And the purpose of doing that is that I think this is a case that really has some big high level issues. I, well, I'm prepared to talk about some of the specific details in the case. I think we've got two big picture fundamental mistakes that once, once we talk about them, you'll see that the fact that you get into the details sort of proves that these were mistakes. For ex and again, I'd also say you mentioned the briefing. The briefing in this case I thought was, was, was excellent. I thought the briefs really set forth. I thought Waterford's brief did a good job. Um, but the two main issues is one is the, the limitation of the comparative fault argument. Um, I, this is a constitutional issue. The right to comparative fault is enshrined in there. Most of the cases talk about the fact that it's always a, a, a case for the jury. And here, uh, the judge made some sort, of, some sort of baffling and almost erratic decisions in allowing, for example, intoxication to go towards questions about whether or not Mr. Waterford turned on his lights or whether or not he put on his seatbelt. But intoxication couldn't be used for avoidance. And that's really what we're going to drill down and talk to about today is the avoidance defense. I know there's a lot of different words that we use about it, but the question in this case when it came to comparative fault was whether or not Mr. Waterford could see the risk that was up there and had an opportunity to, to avoid the accident. And that argument was precluded. It's only avoid, it's mitigate as well, correct? Well, it's, it's both, Your Honor. I think if you look at the, uh, the, the, the record, the experts could talk about two different things. And, and Kuzel kind of talked about this. He said, there's parameters, and there's not, dis there's not specific uh, down to the you know, tenth of a second uh, um, uh, details that could be drawn. They're going to draw an inference, like we talk about the perception reaction time. There's a frame in there. It's like 1.7 to 2.2 seconds. And there's going to be some leeway in the amount of distance. The experts had a difference as to how far Mr. Sanchez's truck got in there. And when you talk about those things, and the question about the speed, we know in the record that, that uh, Mr. Waterford testified that the last thing he remembered was setting the cruise control at 60, and that's the last thing he remembers. There was some uh, information from the experts that looked at crash information on this type of vehicle and made some estimates about how fast the vehicle could have been going. And when you take those brackets into consideration, Mr. Kuzel's uh, opinion was, if he was traveling at a certain speed, he could have stopped. So the accident could have been completely avoided. But it also, if he's traveling at a different speed, maybe, maybe he couldn't have stopped, but he certainly would have been going at a far slower rate of speed at the time of the collision. So that's one of the things that I think goes How much did Mr. Kuzel's opinions rely completely on Mr. Manning's opinions? Uh, well, there's two different parts to that. Uh, Mr. Manning's was 
one of the two experts, both sides had an expert, and both sides came to a determination of how long, or it, and the way it's worded in the brief is a little awkward. The question is, is from the time that Mr. Sanchez started entering the roadway, you know, how, based upon his speed and acceleration and, and everything, how far he's in there gives a distance as, as a time as to how long Mr. Waterford would have had to react. Mr. Manning's opinion was, based upon his calculations, about 6.2 seconds. So, Council, at what point did Waterford, his obligation to take measures to mitigate the possibility of a collision arise? Did it arise at the stop sign? Did it arise at the point of entry? I mean, what, based on Manning's calculations, he included that 14 feet between the stop and the intersection. If you back that out, how reliable are his calculations and why didn't we move like during the motion for reconsideration to remove that 14 feet so that his calculations would be more on par with a legal obligation? Well, Your Honor, I think the, the question you're asking exactly highlights why this is something that the jury should have been allowed to hear. Because the questions of what input or what factors go into an expert's decision uh, goes towards whether or not they have credibility, right? And so the question is going to be, should that 14 feet from the stop bar and the, the, whether that should be included or not is a question of fact that goes towards whether or not... But, but counsel, would you agree with me that a duty to avoid a collision on the part of somebody traveling on a highway does not arise until somebody breaches the plane of the intersection? Not the stop bar, but the intersection. Uh, I'm not sure I would agree with that, Your Honor, because I think the duty arises when a reasonable person would recognize that the preferred driver or the favored driver isn't going to yield. And I don't know if you know when that is, from whether it's the stop sign here. It's, it, it's legally, seeing the risk. When we talk about legally, until he breaks that plane, how would a person traversing on the highway have an obligation to mitigate or avoid a collision? I mean, do you see what I'm asking you? That's a legal question. Where does the duty arise, right? Uh, yes, so the, yes, okay. I agree with you. I see what you're saying. So given that legal question, how are we gonna ask an expert to opine about a legal conclusion when that's not the area of their expertise? I don't think that's what the experts were opining over. Because as, as now I see where your question is okay. going, is you're saying, okay, Sorry, well, sometimes I'm confusing. Well, I apologize. Well, it, it, it seems to me a little bit of a different question, which is why I was having trouble tracking it, is that obviously the, a driver in Mr. Waterford's position isn't going to have a duty to do anything until he recognizes there's a risk. And your question is, look, there's no risk until somebody's in the road. Is that right? <laughs> is that right? That's basically it. Okay. Yes. So. And that's legally there is no risk. Right. I mean, Legally, there is no obligation on the part of somebody traversing on a highway. Would you agree? That is correct. That okay. When there's no risk, there's no obligation to avoid a risk. So there's no duty right. until he gets across there. So why did the expert include that in their calculation, that 14 feet? Which I think is what the trial court really hung their hat on. Would you agree or not? I would not agree. because then Explain to me how I got it wrong because I've reviewed. The, I wasn't there. Tell me. Tell me. Because I think the question that you're asking sort of is baked into the overlap between sort of that, that Daubert gatekeeping standard of we need to make sure that everything is, is, is legitimate in terms of the facts that they rely on and whether they're reasonable to rely on and whether they're applied, those types of 702 standards, right? Correct. But they also sort of apply an overlap in the question of whether or not the, uh, the experts' opinions are, are credible. And that's the difference is that even though this may be the same question, you're, you're framing it in the term of whether or not the legal duty arises because we're not quite sure when he entered the road. We're not quite sure when he may have entered the road because there's, the experts chose different factors. And the question you're asking is the same question that should have been asked on cross-examination at trial when the expert is allowed to testify. I think by taking that question away from the jury, you're saying, as a matter of law, I'm going to not let the, the expert explain why 
his calculations about how long the, the, the distance was going to be are right or wrong. And maybe if you're if the way you're framing the question, you seem to be stating that perhaps the, the time that the truck was in the road and that Mr. Waterford had to see it shouldn't be 6.2 seconds. Although again, I will note that uh, um, we're uh, in the, the weeds. Pl what? We're in the weeds. Well, we are in the weeds, but I also say you know, plaintiff's own expert, Mr. Anderson, addressed the same question. And he came up with 6.8 seconds. So if we're talking about the difference. That's something, again, if we have competing experts, competing experts who have done this the same way and maybe just taken different, uh, slightly different inputs, whether it's based on different assumptions or different brackets they're going to use, and came up with, I guess it's odd to say, the same number close to the same number when we're talking about fractions of a second in the situation, it may make a difference. All that points to things that the jury should have weighed. It's for the jury to decide whether or not, because that, let, let's back up. There's no question that the truck was in the road, right? Right. But I think what you guys are, I think you're talking past each other a little I bit. I do that a lot. So what, what, I, what I, the question I want to ask, which I think is what Judge Campbell asked, but I won't put words in her mouth, is let's say I agree with you on, on almost everything that there was a whole bunch of things that the court seemed to have problems with or the defense calculate or criticized in the motion to limine, or plaintiffs criticized in the motion to limine. But those are completely within the fair purview of what an expert's supposed to do. They're supposed to make assumptions, and sometimes those assumptions may be characterized as guesses, but as long as they're part of a reasonably reliable scientific method that's accepted, we, we let that happen. Where I'm hung up a little bit is on that 14 feet, which is I agree with you that completely that the court or that the you should have been able to tell the jury this is how much time they had to, the the plaintiff had to react from the time that that car entered the intersection the truck entered the intersection but your calculation seemed to include 14 feet which i don't think he had any obligation we you don't have to presume that this car that's inching towards the the intersection is actually going to enter until it does we all assume that the other cars are going to stop. I don't read the record as you ever saying, you're right, Judge, that 14 feet is a problem. We'll back that out, and here's the number is 4.9 seconds or 5.3 seconds if you back out that 14 feet. Am I missing something? I think you are, Your Honor, <laughs> respectfully. Oh, is that, I think, again, you that gets disrespectfully to you. That's fine. <laughs> that gets to the difference between the gatekeeping function and a dispute over credibility. And you're, what you're, the, the, picture that you're drawing there is essentially the judge doing the cross-examination of the expert. I don't think so because there's there's still relevant evidence. It has to be relevant. And I don't, what is the relevance to what the car does before it enters the intersection? Well, what the truck does before it enters the intersection. And you're, you're talking about the time from the stop bar until they enter the intersection, that, that 14 feet. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the question there is, I get something for the expert to explain. He can explain why his calculations would have changed. What is the relevance to that 14 feet? Well, the vehicle, we're talking about how far the vehicle travels, right? From the travel from the stop bar to the thing, and it's 64 feet, or excuse me, 63 yeah. feet or 60 feet are, are the different things. Yeah. From, from, an, from, from a legal perspective, I'm not sure we know the answer as to whether or not, if you take out those 14 feet, how it impacts the rest of the calculations. But here's the problem. Because we don't know that, how reliable is the calculation? I mean, this is what, the, this is what as a gatekeeper, the trial court was trying to do. And if we all agree, legally, a driver does not have the duty to anticipate somebody is going to disobey the law, which is enter the intersection when they have a duty to yield. That's a legal question. How are you gonna cross-examine an expert on a legal question, number one? But number two, why was it included in the calculation if we all agree to that portion? Well, I, I think the, the part of the reason is that if you look at the facts and the way that, that Mr. Sanchez testified about where he stopped and then how he kept going and stuff like uh, and and that type of information with the acceleration and all that, that's where they're working out the numbers. I think that that's the confusion between, again, I, I, it's like a weird line to draw between saying we understand that the legal duty doesn't arise until he enters 
the intersection and he stopped at the stop bar and then he, he, he pulled up there and there's these four, this 14 feet. But what we don't know, because it was never explored, is whether or not that has any relevance in terms of their opinion. And that's, the, and that's what I think the question is. is so are you arguing then that the, the expert needed to use that data, that 14 feet, because that's how he calculated the speed and how far the car got into the intersection and all those other things, because he couldn't, he couldn't pick a number. He had to pick from a stop to go, which in the testimony was that, that he stopped at the stop sign and then inched forward. So that's why that 14 feet is relevant, is to explain the calculation of how fast he estimated Mr. Sanchez was going everything else? Well, I can tell you that that's what he did. I, it's a little more difficult for me to tell you exactly why he did all the things that he did. But when we talk about the facts that we know, we do, you know, or that, that Mr. Sanchez testified to, he testified to that he stopped at the road and that he accelerated. And you've seen in the record there was some dispute about whether or not a constant acceleration rate should be used and what that acceleration rate should be. But in terms of being able to figure out where the car was, that we don't have any data or data points to say, okay, from these 14 feet, this is where you were and these, you know, the acceleration. Those are, that's information that wasn't developed because it wasn't necessary to develop his opinion. His, you wanted to reserve 10 minutes, we're down. Yeah, I'm already five, down ready? to five, so I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, I, I don't wanna not answer your question. Um, I, I feel, and it's not like I think we're talking past Judge Campbell as much as I think that, that Judge Campbell, you're getting hung up on this, on this legal question, but this is a question of, of whether or not, um, uh, his opinion should have been attacked because he did or did not add those 14 feet, not whether or not the 14 feet should have been or should have not been in as a matter of law. I think that's the difference. Okay. Criticize him all you want for adding the 14 feet if you, don't th if you don't think the duty arises there, but criticizing the decisions is a credibility question for the jury. It's not for the gatekeeping function because otherwise I think we all agree these guys are experts. They know what they're doing. If you have a problem with the input, the problem, this specific question about the problem with the input is not a exclude the expert result. It's a let the expert get cross-examined result. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Counsel, are you ready? Thank you, Your Honor. Charles Onifre for the appellee, Nick Waterford. Uh, it, I'm happy that my point in the brief got, got through. And counsel's a, a distinction that it's a really a matter for cross-examination. You can't allow an expert to give a legally irrelevant opinion, and that's what the judge was doing. And just to emphasize how... Do we know that's what the judge was doing? Because I have a hard time figuring out what basis the judge excluded on. You, you argue both on Manning and on Mr. Kurzel and Mr. Kinslow a whole bunch of reasons. You, you, you filed motions with like six different... And the judge said... Precluded, too many guesses. What, what is the basis for the judge's ruling? Well, you've stated what he said in the record. There's nothing more specific to explain it. But from my perspective, it could be any one of a number of those things. It starts with, and I always thought that including a legally irrelevant calculation is sort of the beginning and end of it. When you talk about a legally irrelevant calculation, we're going to play devil's advocate here. On the other side of that, you're driving down the road. You can see the driver doesn't have an obligation to stop, but doesn't your um, heightened awareness come into play? How long your reaction time takes? You've seen it inching towards. You're not going to ignore it. Doesn't that have some relevance to your ability to perceive and stop? Well, I think it goes along with the issue of you're entitled to assume the other person's going to uh, obey the law, and uh, he doesn't have to start reacting to it until there's as Your Honor said, the perception that they're going to uh, violate the statute and not uh, uh, yield. But the if your own, if, I'm sorry. go ahead. If, if, if counsel is accurate that your own expert came up with a, a number similar to theirs, how, what's the basis then for saying that they can't, not only can Manning not testify about this number, which I, I'm kind of on board with you on that, that maybe the number was, was wrong, the 6.2, because of the 14 feet. But what's the basis for saying Kurzel can't testify about reaction time. Um, Kinslow can't testify about uh, ability to perceive and react. How, how did the judge get all the way down that road just based upon saying, well, the 6.2 number was flawed? Because what they need is the opinion from Kuzel that he could have either stopped or significantly reduced his speed. 
that's entirely dependent, entirely dependent on Mr. Manning's conclusion. Because he's calculating ability to stop within 6.2 seconds. As to Mr. Anderson, I guess the reason why... You acknowledge it's not just stop, though. Because what I heard you say is it's ability to stop or significantly slow down. That's what they say. If you're going to make the argument, the... But just as a general matter of law, it's not just complete avoidance of the accident. It is or significantly mitigate it. Well, it is unless you're going to have the backup evidence to say if he had reduced his speed to 20 miles per hour, he would have only sustained these general injuries. You really have to... Your position is that you would have to show he wouldn't have punctured this lung if he was only going 20 miles an hour? The recipe is the seatbelt defense. They knew what to do with the seatbelt defense. Lack of seatbelt. These were the injuries. These were the ones that could have been avoided. That's how you do it. To just tell the jury, well, he could have reduced his speed to 30 miles per hour. You go figure out which of those laundry list of injuries he would have sustained. That's a... General severity of the injuries isn't something that was within the jury's province? Maybe some injuries, but this is a whole laundry list of items. At what point, because he wasn't seatbelt, at what point, what's the speed that you have to go to crack a rib when you're not seatbelted? I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Certainly most lay people. But my point about the calculation that they used in legally, the legal significance is, it's not just the 6.2 was wrong. You don't know how wrong that calculation is. The trucks double its weight. Those first 15 feet or first 14 feet, that takes up a huge amount of the 6.2 seconds. They didn't try and correct it, which is what I was sort of expecting at the trial court, but they never did. Never supplemented their declarations. Never asked for a hearing. Well, the trial court never told them, though, I'm excluding it because of the 14 feet. I think that's correct, but counsel wants a clarification on the basis of the ruling. I mean, it was pretty clear that I was arguing they made too many assumptions in the specific argument about the 14 feet. That was very concrete, especially since they never disputed the law, which is you've got to stop. Well, you also concretely attacked the coefficient of friction, the 0.7 versus 0.55 to 0.8 or whatever. I mean, there was a whole bunch of, you were very specific in your motion in limine on a whole bunch of factors. Here's what I'm getting at. The court said, all I can find anyway, is the court said too many guesses. The guesses are all the things that you criticize, which I think are appropriate for an expert to do. Guess between, well, we have to figure out what a speed was, and here's a guess, and we have to figure out, here's a reasonable guess, I should say, and we have to figure out what the coefficient of friction was, and here's a reasonable guess. We have to figure out acceleration. Here's a reasonable guess. The 14 feet was the only thing that wasn't a guess. So if I'm reading the court's ruling that says too many guesses, I would think he's actually criticizing all the other things and not the 14 feet. Am I missing something? I mean, you're reading his comment correctly. I don't know what to say other than that's what he said. They should have moved for clarification or something, yeah. But let's look at the 30,000-foot view. The problem that they had in the case was exactly why I took the case in what you saw. You had no witnesses. You had no road evidence. Neither party remembered anything that was of any value to the accident. And what do they have to reconstruct it? They are literally reconstructing from nothing the fact that there's a collision that occurred. That by itself tells you, boy, there's a lot of guesswork. And what's the opinion that we get that they want to put forward ultimately? Again, Manning's opinion is necessary for Cruzel to say he could have come to a stop or close to a stop. What does close to a stop mean? I don't know. You mean 10 miles an hour? You mean 20 miles an hour? 30? He doesn't tell us. Let's talk about the impairment evidence and how the impairment evidence was limited by the trial court. It was limited in regard to everything but use of a seat belt. Is that correct? And headlights. And headlights. And the headlights and seat belt. That is why the court allowed it, yes. It was not allowed to be used as evidence that the accident was avoidable. And if we don't get all the way to avoidable, we get to could have been less severe in nature if he wasn't impaired. Why is it proper to exclude that kind of evidence? Because you need to bring it together. Just like the seat belt defense, you say that he could have reacted quicker because he was impaired? Fine. What does that translate to? 
with some reason. They weren't able to come up with anything to state it, what that range would be, which is why taking that 14 feet out of the calculation is so important. Because if there's only two seconds to react, well, that's a completely different calculation. And that even assumes that you can figure out the speed. Here's the evidence on the speed. No witness. They have Nick saying, I set my cruise control at 60, eight miles earlier. No skid marks. And an opinion about impact speed based on crush. Where did he go from, if he didn't break, which is what the defense was saying, how did he go from 60 to either 29 or 49? He slowed at some point in time. Where did he slow? Pick a place anywhere between the point of impact and eight miles back. What did he slow to? Pick a number between 29 and 60. That's how speculative the opinions were because of the complete absence of evidence. And to allow experts with all of that uh, speculation, because that is what it amounts to, my assumption has to be right. Counsel, isn't in this situation it up to the experts to help us? That's why they're experts. I can make stuff up, but you're not going to accept that. So when we look at expert testimony, it's to help us reconstruct what happened based on assumptions that all experts, your expert made assumptions. So well, why is this not a cross-examination issue, cross issue versus a preclusion issue? It's for the very reason that the Supreme Court came up with the gatekeeper uh, idea. We're not going to let you say something that doesn't have, a, have sufficient reliability such that it might confuse or mislead the jury. Experts come with certain impressions. Boy, this guy really knows what he's talking about. Well, actually, he doesn't because he's making all these assumptions. That's what the court takes into consideration. But it's too much of a guess. Is it the assumptions or is it the methodology? Because I read Daubert as saying you can attack and preclude an expert who's not using reliable methodology or not generally accepted uh, principles. But the assumption seems to be clearly a, a kind of thing that's perfect for cross-examination and goes beyond Daubert. You have to apply the facts and data reasonably to the method. And I'm not disputing their qualifications. I used Joe Manning. We used Mike Cousel as experts. I had him in trial six months after that. <laughs> Uh, we're not doubting the methodology, the way that they went through the process. Well, that is how you would try and reconstruct it. It's just that you can't. And when counsel says, well, Mr. Anderson came up with opinions, yeah, he came up with opinions based on the available evidence. I got him, if we ever had to address it, hey, Bob, tell us why this is all guesses and speculation. If they used him as their witness, they used Mr. Manning, they didn't use my, uh, Mr. Anderson, but if they put him on the stand, it'd be the same thing, the same problems with the same analysis. He's not clairvoyant. Calculating from the same incorrect spot, he's just duplicating what Mr. Manning did. Numbers come up a little bit different because of the acceleration assumption, which, by the way, was wrong, which was not just an assumption, but an incorrect assumption because of the testimony by Mr. Sanchez. I started off normal acceleration whatever that means to an expert. But when I saw the headlights, I rapidly accelerated. So not only do they have the first 14 feet included in that 6.2, how much of that 6.2 is that? Then you have, well, I didn't factor in, there was increased acceleration. That number, the time that was available from when he breached the road edge to impact, you don't have the first clue about what that number is other than it's probably not longer than 6.2. Is it more than a second? Probably, but we don't know. We don't have the first clue. And if you don't know the answer to that, you can't answer any other question in that reconstruction analysis. So why should the trial judge allow an expert to get up there and suggest that they can? Because they can't. It is nothing but a guess. With a huge range that they never tried to clarify. I didn't take their deposition. I didn't know if they are going to try and clean that up. But that's a strategic decision I made. They can't spring a new opinion on me during trial. Now, they didn't say they were going to try and do that. But if they really had an answer to these questions that I raised, they would have brought in a supplemental declaration. And they would have or asked for a hearing where they could draw this out. 
the conclusion that I would draw from that is they know exactly what the problem is. And if I could just say something about Mr. Cruzel's opinion real, real briefly. His entire opinion is based on two factors, just like Mr. Manning's was based on two factors. His was as well. Perception of reaction time and the slide distance. Slide distance is just math. PRT is the opinion that he needed to offer. He wasn't telling us his opinion. He was telling us, I plugged some numbers into a program and I came up with something. Now, I know opposing counsel uh, tried to distinguish the cases that we cited. Uh, they cited some cases in support uh, of their position where apparently there was some foundation laid about the reliability of Mr. Mutart's program. Well, maybe that was done in those cases. It wasn't done here. They didn't supplement uh, after the motion to in limine was filed. They didn't bring a supplemental declaration or ask for a hearing or offer testimony from Mr. Cruzel. Let me tell you exactly why Mutart's program is reliable. They didn't do that. And if they had brought him, one of my questions to him would have been, our accident is a nighttime accident with a truck pulling a trailer. Most people don't expect trailers to be, come behind a vehicle. And we missed the truck. We hit the trailer. You tell me that Mr. Mutart has information from a study that included a scenario that resembled that. And the answer to that question is, I don't know. And nobody knows because they didn't try and establish it. So that's the opinion he was trying to offer. And all he says is, hey, I threw it into the blender, Mr. Mutart's uh, IDRR program, or whatever the name of it is. And this is what Mr. Mutart says. Well, we don't let experts come in and say, let me tell you, I'm here to tell you the important opinion about perception and reaction time. And my important opinion about perception and reaction time is that guy said it was 2.2. You can't do that. He's saying, all he's doing is saying, this person who's not in the courtroom says it's 2.2 yeah, or 1.2. But experts routinely testify based upon opinions and scientific analysis performed by others. They don't have to do it themselves. But the difference is, that's the opinion being offered. He's not using it as a foundation for another opinion. That whole opinion about uh, can somebody stop in 6.2 seconds, it's entirely dependent on perception and reaction time. And I come back to impairment directly relates to perception and reaction time. And they were precluded from presenting most of that evidence except for in regard to headlights and seatbelt, not in regard to stop time. And you're saying that's because they can't make it relevant in proving it made a difference in the accident. I mean, that's the whole point. If you can't tell me that had an, this person been unimpaired, if you can't tell me that an unimpaired person could have avoided it or reduced their speed to this speed and would have avoided these injuries, why am I going to allow the opinion at all? That's they got to prove something. They can't just throw it out there for the jury to, uh, to try and figure out, yes, he could have reduced his speed. I don't know to what amount. I don't know how much time he had to reduce his speed. Here's a laundry list of injuries. You figure out how much he could have reduced, how fast he was going, number one, which they don't know, how much time he had to react, which they don't know. And what was the speed that he was going when he reacted and how much time and how much did he reduce his speed to? They don't know. They don't know the answer to any of those questions. That is exactly when the court should step in and say, you know what? This is misleading to the jury because they can't give you answers to those questions. And I agree, the court didn't articulate exactly why it was ruling that. Um, his comment about too many guesses, the generic comment, in my view, it encompassed everything. You know, that's what it is. It's, a, it's you look at the whole thing and say, well, I, this just doesn't seem like something I want the jury to hear. Because what good was it? What good was it for Mr. Cruzel to say, 
with all these assumptions, some of which are wrong, by the way, because I relied on Mr. Manning, and Mr. Manning calculated 6.2 seconds, and we know that's wrong. He should have been able to come to a stop or near stop, but I can't tell you what that is. What does that tell the jury? How does that help them in their deliberations? And if they were to argue, based on that evidence, it proves Mr. Waterford could have avoided the cracked ribs. Really? Where would you have heard that? So I, so I want you to spend your last one minute and 53 seconds talking about the denial of the requested instructions. I'd just like you to address that argument and give me your best reasoning why that was the right call. Why the jury should not have been instructed on comparative fault about avoidability because there wasn't evidence, there wasn't that testimony about he could have avoided it or mitigated his damages by reduced speed. And I think the whole argument, yours and theirs, rises and falls on the first issue, the 702. Should it have come in? Should it not have come in? You would agree? I think so. All right. I think that's, if, look, if he let that evidence in, then that was some evidence of avoidability, imprecise as it might be. But that's how I always looked at it. It was the entire case turned on the admissibility of those expert opinions. It really did. And so the answer to your question is yes, I agree. It, uh, whether they never made the showing to get the jury to consider. If those experts were allowed to testify, then they would have gotten the instruction on comparative fault and avoidability or not avoiding. It's just so I'm clear. Your position is that evidence regarding the inability of drunken high people to perceive events and the react to timely is not relevant unless you can put a specific number to say that they would have, it reduced it by this much and if it hadn't, then they wouldn't have been able to avoid the accident. You have to be able to say it made a difference. That an unimpaired person, the outcome would have been different with an unimpaired person. And I think you could, yeah, you have to make that showing through expert testimony because you can't, or you just let the jury rely on their own impression of how that would have affected it. But that's where you, you get to the point of, well, what's speculation? A jury figuring out, well, I don't know how fast he was going. I don't know how fast he could have reduced his speed to, but let me pick a number and then try and figure out which of those injuries would have been avoided. It's all speculation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, counsel. You know, what I heard from counsel here is a great closing argument and a great cross-examination, but it doesn't really go to answering the question uh, that Judge Campbell was asking me earlier about the difference between the duty and answering the questions. Everything I heard would have been a great question to ask the expert on the stand about why did you include this? How did it impact your numbers? And then arguing to the jury later, you shouldn't believe these guys because they made these mistakes in adding in these 14 feet, if that's where we're going to focus in on. But all these other questions, I, I, I really don't think uh, the rest of Cruzel's opinion with the, the, the Mutart regression, all that stuff is it's widely accepted. The idea that, they, that, that this was just putting it in a blender. His expert report, which I think in the record at 126, it, it, it self-identifies the record and then it's been peer reviewed and, and why this program works. I, I don't know if that's really the issue. If we're gonna focus in on the 6.2, I feel like I still wanna answer Judge Campbell's question. And I think we all agree that at some point he was gonna have a duty, right? That Waterford was going to have a duty to yield because at some point that Mr. Sanchez's vehicle was in the middle of the road when he comes, the, the, the actual facts of it. But at some point we're gonna know he has this big old truck with this big old trail and he's moving it slowly over the thing. And at some point it's going to arise. So the question or not whether the legal duty arises at all, I think is answered. Because we know for a fact that the accident occurred and because of uh, the way the accident happened, there was going to be some time. So there's some duty arose. The question you keep asking though is, well, what's the time because maybe these 14 feet should or shouldn't have been included? I keep kind of going back to the fact that if Mr. Waterford thought that the 14 feet shouldn't have been included, then maybe his expert shouldn't have included it. 
I think that would have been something that would have been nice to flesh out in front of the jury between the experts. I mean, it almost seems a little bit like a, 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 a sort of an after-the-fact argument here of the Court of Appeals, but as... Well, it's not after the fact. They, they well, hammered this in their motions in limine below as well. But again, I don't, I'm not so sure that this is a situation where things could have been sort of supplemented as much as it's a question of, this is for the jury to decide. Whether the jury's going to decide to accept or reject the opinions of the expert because the inputs were good or bad or different than one counsel or the other wanted all goes towards the, 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 the 702 arguments that we've been talking about. And I think one of the things that I think Judge Campbell may be doing is sort of drilling down a little bit too far, that there were, we're talking about the gatekeeping function. I mean, Daubert keeps out junk science, right? I mean, that's really what we're talking about at the beginning and, and whether these guys are qualified. And, and counsel's conceded they were qualified. The, the real specific nitpicking is you should have picked uh, I'm guessing here, 50 feet instead of 64 feet, or 49 feet instead of 63 feet. You know what that is? That's cross-examination. That's for the jury to decide. You've got a minute left, and I want to hear your best argument regarding the denial of your requested jury instruction. I disagree that uh, the experts are required to put this information before the jury. I think when we're talking about impairment and this level of impairment, uh, the fact that the impairment wasn't undisputed, plus the other facts that go into it. If we're looking at a contributory negligence thing, the lights are flashing. It's the middle of the night. It's clear. I think everybody's conceded that you could have seen this from far away. And while I agree that uh, a driver may not necessarily have the duty to yield until they recognize, and we've talked about when they, at some point that duty arose, and whether or not you even talk about the specific numbers, I think you get to go to before a jury and say, there's no evidence of breaking. I'm always baffled when I hear this argument that there's no other evidence. There's evidence out there. There's measurements that can be taken. We know where the collision happened. We know that there was no breaking. So we know that the question may be not whether or not he saw it at all, maybe sort of uh, not quite a red herring, but it doesn't matter if he's blacked out. You know, it doesn't matter if he could see that the time difference doesn't matter because he didn't do anything. And I'm not sure I heard anything in, or saw anything in the record that suggested that um, this was such a sudden accident that there was no time to react. You know, part of what we've been fighting about is how long does it get this giant truck and heavy trailer across the road? There's going to be some time to react. And I think the jury needed to decide whether or not a sober person in that same position would have had any time to react because there was no reaction at all. So the jury should have been allowed to hear comparative fault, even without the experts. Anything else? No. All right. Well, counsel, it was a rousing discussion. I appreciate both of you uh, walking us through that so carefully. We will take this matter under advisement. We will issue a written ruling in due course. And at this point, we are at recess. We're going. Okay.